You're listening to the Missionary Perspective Podcast with veteran missionaries Eric Johnson and Joshua Mead. We're glad you could join us. We trust this podcast will be both a blessing and a challenge as we relate topics in world evangelism from a missionary perspective. Now, here's Josh and Eric. Well, good morning, Josh. How are you guys doing? Merry Christmas, belated Merry Christmas. I understand you guys finally got to celebrate it. Tell us a little bit about how things are going there in Senegal post-Christmas. Yeah, well, post Christmas, uh, we we had a heat wave actually just a little bit prior to Christmas arrival, which is a little bit unusual, but we've been uh, enjoying the weather as best we can. Uh, But we had a really good Christmas. Um, It was a unique Christmas this year. Whenever we're back on furlough, which we had an extended furlough this past year, uh, Julie will try to either send um, a crate, we've sent containers in the past, or a barrel, we'll ship a barrel over. Well, this year we sent over a lift van crate, and a lift van crate is basically uh, seven foot tall, four foot wide, and seven feet long, and it's the right size to squeeze into the back of a 20-foot container. And so we went ahead and shipped one of those, filled it up with different goodies, and Julie will get two to three years worth of Christmas and birthday gifts. I get like one one year worth of birthday and Christmas gifts for, for everybody. I'm not good at that, but she, she's got three years down the road planned. And so she put everything in there. We shipped it in August, right? So, you know, maybe maximum it would be here in two months. It would be here in time for Christmas. And uh, one month goes by, two months go by three, four months go by and this thing hasn't arrived yet. And we tracked it from New York Harbor to Belgium. And then we didn't know what ship that it transferred to from from Belgium. It just sat in Belgium for a couple months. And I think a big reason is because of the global supply chain and everything's halted and slowed down. And so they probably had to wait until enough materials coming to Senegal Uh, would fill up an entire container to ship that thing down here. And so we actually didn't get it until the week after. It arrived before Christmas, but then there were further complications with the transiting company that was supposed to get it out of harbor. And uh, that was another headache and calling the guy and just trying to coordinate things. And it was um, the day before Christmas Eve and the guy said, I'm going to get you the container. It's going to come and uh, your crates will be there Christmas Eve. You're going to have it in time for Christmas because I kept telling him, I, I need this for my kids. I've got gifts in here, you know. And so Christmas that night comes. I call him up. I said, hey, did it did it get out of port? Did it clear customs? Is it on its way? And he says, oh, well, I'll tell you, they um, they told me to go pay for one more thing. So he said, I went to the other office, I paid for it. And when I came back to the customs office at 3 p.m., they were closed for the day, shut down, and they went home. And of course, Christmas Eve and the whole weekend, they're, the whole weekend they're closed. And so um, I said, all right, all right. Well, Christmas is more than just gifts, right? It's about celebrating the birth of Jesus. And so we were going to have a wonderful Christmas anyways, uh, just thanking the Lord for his coming and his birth. Well, Julie's family, her sister, about a month earlier, decided to send us a uh, package through the mail, which we haven't received packages in the mail for a long time because it's so expensive. When people contact us and ask us, you know, would you like us to send you a package in the mail or would you rather just the funds? We tell them, you know, for the money it costs to ship something in the U.S. Postal Service, we can take that money and buy items here for, you know, much. We can make the money go further. So we'll tell people, if you know, if you want to send us something, uh, just send the money and we'll go to the American store. We'll buy some American goodies for the kids. And so for the past four or five years, that's what we've been doing. And uh, but her sister decided to send a package, a bunch of Christmas gifts inside it. Tim Horton's coffee. Oh yes, praise the Lord. Well, she she kept asking if it arrived and it wasn't it hadn't arrived. Well, Christmas Eve, I drove down in the morning to the post office just to check if it come. I didn't even know if they'd be open. And because it's a Muslim uh, country, that wasn't set as a holiday. So I walk into the post office, it was open, open up the post office box and there is the sheet of paper 
informing me that my package has arrived. We can get it out. And so the kids had Christmas gifts to open up Christmas morning anyways. And it's just, it's those little things there that the Lord does that, you know, it's, it, Christmas is more than just gifts, but even just that's a tradition. It's something that we enjoy, you know, and so being able to share gifts with your kids and opening gifts on Christmas morning, um, it, it was neat to see how the Lord had done that. And then we got to celebrate Christmas all over again just the other night when our crate got here and uh, opened up all the gifts for the kids. And so, yeah, we, we had a wonderful Christmas, though. And in fact, our uh, Christmas Eve service for the church, we had 50 plus people out and uh, most most of them are regular attenders. They they all came out at once. We were crammed in our room, and uh, just an excellent program that was put on, and great message by Pastor Malik. And so it's encouraging just to see what the Lord's doing here. But and you guys had a great Christmas. I I saw some videos and pictures of your church and your family. Yes, we had another very enjoyable Christmas here on the mission field. Um, the week before Christmas, we had our Christmas program where the teenagers put on a small drama and all three, the children's choir, teen choir, and adult choir participated. And we were very blessed to have a number of uh, unsaved people come out, family members, hear the gospel. So that's really always our goal is as we put on these uh, performances and choir presentations that we can get unsaved people to come out and hear the true uh, reason for the season. So it was a lot of work. Uh, we, we put in a lot of effort, and uh, but thankfully we, we saw uh, those who performed did a very excellent job for the glory of God, and then saw a lot of people come out and hear the gospel. So we were very encouraged by that. And then in the Dominican, I think we mentioned this before, really Dominicans, they don't celebrate Christmas on Christmas Day like we do in America. Really, uh, La Noche Buena, the Christmas Eve, is when they get all their family together and have a very big uh, meal. And so during the week, more than ever, we were very blessed to be able to give out a lot of food to needy families. Uh, there were some businessmen who actually approached us as they saw that we were doing a food drive in our church to help out needy families, that they actually, unbeknownst to us, had collected even more food and asked if they could uh, give us some bags of food to give out to needy families. So we were able to help out a lot of families, and our kids were uh, a vital part of that, and they were very encouraged by that. So uh, between them getting their gifts and them being able to give gifts to other people, it really was a a wonderful Christmas. And so we're we're thankful for Christmas, and I'm thankful that it's over because we do a lot of activities. Now, uh, today, we're doing something different. We're kind of looking back. In fact, the title of our podcast today is Looking Back Before You Look Forward. Uh, I am not the world's greatest. Maybe Josh is this way. I know some other people are really good. I'm not the world's greatest, maybe visionary as far as looking forward and setting uh, goals is and maybe resolutions. I do set them spiritually, physically, uh, mentally, uh, ministerially. Uh, but one of the things I try to do, and my, with my wife's help and those who partner with us in the ministry, I do try to look back before we look forward and look over the previous year, maybe the previous couple of years, look at our ministries and see if um, they're accomplishing what we desire them to accomplish. And so today, Josh, I think it's, uh, it's important for us before we look forward to look back. Is that something you do routinely at the end of every year? Oh, certainly at the end of every year, end of every month. <laughs> I think self-evaluation is uh, essential to ministry growth. And uh, I think it's very important that you learn and and grow from the past and uh, what's worked, what hasn't, reevaluate and move forward uh, with those things. And so, yeah, definitely, especially the end of the year is really a good transition time. Everything just kind of settles after Christmas and then it's going to start picking up steam again in the new year. And so it's a great time to reflect and then uh, move forward for sure. And so I think you're going to share a little bit about kind of a – What's your process? What's your thought process as you sit down and reflect and you plan to move forward in your ministry in the next steps? How does the past for you, Brother Johnson, how does that play a role as you move forward? What is what is that evaluation process look like for you? Well, I will say this is something that is always developing and um, it's very basic. It's very rudimentary. But I think the first thing and, and it seems maybe very simple and obvious, but the first thing we always want to do when we consider our ministries, I think, is to make sure that they are biblical. Um, we want to make sure that they are flowing out of the word of God and based on the principles of God's word. For instance, uh, I, I was thinking today, what are some 
ministries that would not be biblical or based upon God's word. And recently there was someone who came from a different church background who was wondering if we could start basically for lack of a better term, a, a dance team ministry, you know, having dances. Now I do know there may be someone listening to us who come from different cultural backgrounds, Well, maybe that is accepted. And, but in our culture, a dance team ministry would be basically sensual and individualistically minded. And so there's, there's nothing biblical about that. I don't have to pray about that. We can say, you know, we're not really going to be doing that and try the kindest way to say, you may have had that in your background before, but we try to have our ministries based on the Bible. So it does seem obvious for us to say, hey, it's got to be um, biblically minded, biblically based, but, but it is important uh, because sometimes we can uh, maybe get out of, out of bounds in some of those things. But obviously as church planning missionaries, we should strive not only to have biblical ministries, but ones that have the ultimate goal to lead people to the local church. Uh, over the years, I've had to make adjustments with ministries that don't necessarily direct people to the local church. But but first and foremost, what I like to do, and Josh, you can comment on this, is I I like to start with our kind of our pillars of our ministries. And that really starts with our Sunday morning service and then other services we have out during the week. And let me just say, uh, if anybody has the, the recipe or the success or the, the, the special formula to make sure that your midweek service is as well attended as your Sunday service. I'm still waiting to uh, learn about that because that's something that I think pretty much every church in every context strives to um, get people out in the middle of the week to have some sort of Bible study, prayer time. And for us, for instance, that took many years of consideration. At the end of the year, every year, I was like, why can't we seem to get people out in the middle of the uh, week? And really, finally, for us, I think the biggest adjustment for us was saying, in our context, a lot of the people worked until well past seven o'clock. Right. And so we had to come to an agreement. We said, you know, we're going to start church at 730 at night. Now, it seems kind of late for some people. Uh, we're going to try and make it very efficient where people come in, sing a few songs, we have a Bible study, and then we pray together. But it was very important for us that we could get people's faithfulness to more than one church service and so that took a lot of time we tried different days of the week we like i said we tried different times and finally just through trial and error and i think a lot of this is that because there's nothing in the bible that says we have to start at seven o'clock or 6 30 or 7 30 that has to do with your context but i think it is biblical to try to get people first and foremost uh, for us our pillars are getting them out to the main church services ha have you had experience in that trying to figure out some of those logistical situations yeah, one of the big ones was our transition from our Sunday night being our primary service rather than our Sunday morning service. Um, and I think I mentioned this in past podcasts um, where we would have our core group of members. It, this was when the other missionary was here. And it's just something that they had established uh, for decades, even before we got here, that somehow the Sunday night was more a bigger emphasis than the Sunday morning, which is fine. But what I found was we were having two separate crowds on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and we wanted to bring those two together. And so, yeah, we did a transition when Pastor Malik, uh, to, you know, came in and when he became the lead pastor, right before he became the lead pastor, um, we did a transition where we started going to people's houses. We stopped our Sunday morning service completely and Pastor Malik and I went house to house and uh, on Sunday morning, we'd start at about eight in the morning and we'd go till about one o'clock and we'd go to every church member's house and they knew we were coming and we'd pray with them. We'd read, re we would read a passage of scripture and we basically ran a service in their house the same way we did our, our beginning of our church plant, just a Bible reading, a, a exposition of the passage. And then if anybody wanted to give any questions, we'd open it up to that. And even that, that was great because that opened up a lot of doors to um, if any unsaved family members were present and they could, you know, within hearing distance, they would pause and, you know, they could hear that. Um, and then eventually what we did right before we went on furlough and Pastor Malik took over is we told everybody, OK, our Sunday night, uh, we're, we're going to stop doing our Sunday night. And so everybody needs to be here on Sunday morning. 
We're ordaining Pastor Malik this Sunday morning. Everybody needs to be here. We got everybody to it. We set the time. Everybody came out. And then we just told everybody this is when the normal service is. And uh, about a month before we went on furlough, everybody came out on that 11 a.m. service. And uh, the rest was history. Now everybody's main, uh, everybody comes in that morning service. Um, we haven't started our Sunday night up again. Uh, we're looking at, uh, probably once we get a property, then we're going to do two services. One will be held in our property where we build the church building. That will be our primary service. That's a little bit outside of town. And then we're going to do a French service um, here in this building where we live. So we'll still have a, a church service held in town, uh, but that'll be a little more low key and uh, we'll be reaching more expatriates, not necessarily reaching uh specifically Wolof people, but we'll be branching out to those who uh, maybe don't understand Wolof or aren't as, you know, drawn to speaking Wolof, which is what our Sunday morning service is. So yeah, those are things that we just, we looked at, we evaluated, we felt this is going to be a good approach. So we looked at what was happening in the past. We made a plan, we, we implemented it and uh, it just happened to work. And so, yeah, definitely those things are, are important to look at what's working, what's not working, where do you want things to go? And then you got to make a plan and implement it, stick to the plan, and, and those things can come to fruition. It's funny because when we started sending out church planters, we tried to do our church services. In fact, we've never had a Sunday night church service because of the work structure here in the Dominican uh, most of our church members work six days a week or five and a half. They work maybe a half day on Saturday. And so they don't often get many days off. And so what we decided was we were going to have a longer church service in the morning. Right. And then when we started planting other churches, try to maybe uh, do their church services in the evening. And that's what we did. We had Pastor Ari's church service started at six. Pastor Elias starts at five. Our church service started at 10 a.m. And so it also enabled us to be able to help each other out. Well, when COVID hit, uh, Pastor Ari had to make some changes and he had his church service starting at nine in the morning. Well, they liked it so much. They just kept it because they like being done church by 10, 15 or 10, 30, and they have the rest of the day. And I said, Hey, that just changed up all my plan. I had my plan, but no, now they're their own church. They have to do what's best for them. And so that that's kind of the point of this podcast is just that you know, encouraging you to constantly be thinking about, uh, the things that are biblical and keeping them the same and yet making tweaks and changes to our schedules and maybe how we we handle things. And so, for instance, there's some ministries like for many years, we've done men's and ladies Bible studies. Sometimes they've been weekly. Sometimes they've been bi-monthly. Sometimes they've been, um, you know, every month. Uh, a lot of this just depends on the season of life. And, you know, one of my standards for determina de determination of do we need another Bible study during the week with the men or the women or the teens uh, has a lot to do with the overall faithfulness of the church members uh, who are being faithful to the church services. And what I mean by that is we have often had people who are very faithful to a ladies Bible study who don't mind coming for often many hours to sit on a sofa and, and uh, talk and listen about God's word, but getting them out there for our Thursday night midweek Bible service sometimes was a, was a chore. And so we're constantly kind of reevaluating the participation of the men, the women, the teens in if we're going to add on other ministries. We know having a teen ministry and having a ladies and men's Bible study, there's nothing wrong with them. They're certainly biblical, but our main goal is Sunday morning service, our midweek prayer time. Are we seeing the faithfulness we want there? And so that's maybe one of the filters we have with that. Now, evangelism, obviously, uh, evangelism is a very biblical uh, ministry that every church should have. However, every church we work with here, and as Josh will explain as he has in the past, we all come to it from a different dynamic, a different approach, a different context. For instance, in our church is a very uh, middle class to maybe even some affluent area. And so for us to do the typical knock on the door, door to door evangelism, uh, first of all, you have two lines of defense. You have a main gate that is barred and then their front door is barred. And then this is pretty COVID before that um, it was always very difficult to find homeowners, not only home, but willing to open two doors to let you come in and, and share the gospel. So we had to be very creative and trying to find ways to meet people maybe in parks and other public settings where we're both in kind of a, a, a third party area where we're not feel like we're evading their space 
where they, uh, for instance, sometimes we put out a um, we put out a table with Bibles and say, you know, come take this survey and receive a Bible. And so if people are already approaching you, they're approaching you with a spiritual mindset. And so we, in our first church, we had to have a different creative way, whereas where Pastor Ari serves, and Pastor Elias serve, we can do evangelism maybe more traditionally like we did in the States where we can go to their homes. And they're very used to having people either in their home or in the front doorstep. Uh, there's not very many barriers. And so I think constantly with, with, with evangelism, we have to think, are we having the impact? Are we reaching people? Are we, are we reaching out? Are we taking the necessary time? Are we training leaders to be a part of that? And, and, and Josh, I think you even have had spoke about this, but maybe for this podcast, you can speak briefly about how you've had to, over the years, uh, modify the evangelism of your church. Yeah, certainly. You know, the the most effective evangelism in an Islamic context is going to be um, somebody who's former Muslim, somebody from within the culture uh, who's gotten saved. And that's going to take years, though, before they build credibility. Uh, and there's so many obstacles to overcome uh, with it, the Islamic faith and the mindset that people have. Um, just the other day, I saw online there's a group of Muslims that do their own teaching. It's called Dawah. Dawah is the teaching of Islam. It's basically evangelism for Islam. And one of their approaches to get people in Senegal who are already Muslim, their objective is to get people to become more Muslim, to get them to actually know and study the Quran and understand true Islam, not just the tradition in the, 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 surface level that is mostly found here. And one of their approaches to either try to get Muslims to get deeper into Islam or to appeal to Catholics is they'll wear t-shirts and hold up signs and go street preaching. And their signs will say, I love Jesus because I am Muslim. <laughs> and so they have their approach and they're very direct about it. And so we can do street preaching here and some people do we pass out tracks and some people do but the ones who are doing it mostly for example in islam the guys who are out in the public doing it trying to get people to get deeper in islam are senegalese but they're being backed by and taught by uh, egyptian brotherhood they're over here doing stuff and and they're here teaching in the chronic schools but they're not the ones out the front. So they, they, there's an entire mission work here of Islamic missionaries okay, that have come from other places in the Middle East, uh, Egypt and other places, and they come here and do the teaching and then send their disciples and their students out to do the, so, you know, quote unquote, evangelism of Islam. And that's similar to, I think, I think what happened was a lot of them researched and studied how missionaries who were evangelizing the nations in Africa and they just kind of copied that model where missionaries would come in and do a lot of the teaching and then it's the nationals who are going to be most effective. So from a personal standpoint, that's something I came to understand over time is that I still do personal evangelism, but if I train somebody to be an effective evangelist to effectively preach and share the gospel with their family and friends, they're going to reach far more people than I will. So I'll do my, I put my time in with personal evangelism, but I invest just as much, if not more time in cultivating discipleship and helping others become more effective in their gospel ministry. Um, one of the ways we'll do event, like I'll do evangelism. We have these little USB sticks that we fill up with, all of our uh, audio and video from our productions. Uh, there's a, a ministry called the Rock International. Paul Bramson was a missionary here for 25 plus years here in our city. And he's developed all kinds of resources in multiple language that are geared toward evangelizing Muslims. And so we'll use a lot of his material and we'll put it on these little USB sticks that can plug into an Android. Most everybody has an Android phone here and they'll plug it into their Android phone and they can, they can listen and watch to it all. So there's a guardian of a friend of ours who's a missionary on the other side of town 
And, uh, he just contacted me this morning. He said, Hey Josh, he said, uh, our guardian, he, he got that USB you gave him with all the material on it. He's been listening to it every night and he's really open right now. And, uh, he's been asking a lot of pertinent questions and he actually asked if I could come by to kind of follow up and see where he's at in his, um, study of the Bible that we've been doing. And so a lot of my personal evangelism is relationship building, um, I'm going to engage people in relationship. And sometimes that comes through helping a guy out just the other day, pay a bill for his daughter's, uh, she needed a prescription. So I gave him $5 and then I invited him to come to a Sunday service. And then he came out and then I've had him come out a couple times and sat down and, and, uh, just slowly, you know, building that relationship. Uh, a lot of times they're just looking for financial aid, but if, if done properly and wisely, you can use that to open a door to reach people because when you open your heart and, and you're giving, uh, nothing is more Christ-like than giving. And so uh, we try to use that to our advantage as much as possible as well. And so, um, but yeah, it's, those are things that if you're going to be an effective communicator of the gospel and evangelist on the field that you're called to reach, you have to constantly evaluate uh, kind of, you know, who did I speak to this year? Uh, how well did they receive the gospel? How can I better sh present the gospel? Am I, am I growing? Are there new books I can read? Is there, is there somebody I can talk to to continue to grow in my understanding of the culture and events here? And so those are all important. Yeah, it's very interesting to see in our context here in the Dominican, um, really the only people out evangelizing are the Mormons and the, and the Jehovah's Witness. And actually, since COVID, you don't even see that. In fact, the way the Jehovah's Witnesses are uh, evangelizing now is through telephone calls. Okay. They are calling homes. I actually got a call the other day. And so, um, but one thing I will say, and I want to make sure to add this in there to anybody, whatever context they have, obviously there are regions of the world where it may be dangerous to do a lot of door to door. Uh, we still try to get out and do some sort of canvassing and and passing out uh, flyers and tracks, if only, even if we don't get a lot of access to homes, is to let our community know that we're there. I think it's always very important, if you can, if there's no risk to that, to always just to be letting know your community know. One of our well-known pastor friends in our circles basically said, you know, what you want to do a lot of times is deal with people and hope to be their pastor one day. You know, basically the idea is that everybody needs a pastor one day. And um, you don't know what that day is going to be, but if you've made it known that you're a Bible preacher in the area and people, maybe they've, they've met you, you've saluted them, you said hello, they kind of, they know who you are. A lot of times people will come to you in their time of need and uh, you may just simply because you've passed out flyers and tracks to their homes for years at a time, uh, you just never know how the Lord's going to open that opportunity. So that, those are the things I think we know off the bat. They're, these aren't complicated things. These are um, ministries we all should have and be constantly developing and trying to do better. Now, let's del delve a little deeper. When we talk about ministries, we're talking about not just the preaching and teaching ministry, not just evangelism. Uh, every church is different. So some of the ministries we have in our church, Josh, may, you may not have in your church or missionary friend you're listening, you may not have these, but these are some of the ideas that we're talking about when we come from our context. We're talking about things like uh, primary kids class, a uh, teen ministry, nursery, uh, reception team. Uh, we're talking about sound room and communications, things like choir. Now I say event decorating team, often that just becomes my wife and I, but we're trying to work on that. Uh, security, parking lot, bus driving ministry. Those are the kind of ministries that we're going to kind of talk to today about how you can maybe evaluate um, not only how you're doing it, but to see if it's, it's, is it successful in a spiritual sense, if you have the right leaders, uh, Josh, what are some maybe other ministries you might have in your context that you would add in there? We do film nights uh, just because we were, which we, we had stopped doing that. I mean, we had to stop because of COVID and everything, but we were doing a Friday night film night. People would come out from the church and make popcorn. We'd have, we'd have average 60 to 100 kids and teens. And then uh, we would do other nights where we would have adults, just depending on what films we were showing. Uh, we're going to reopen that soon, uh, kind of take a different approach, though. We're going to target, uh, be a little more target specific in the groups that we have come in. But yeah, that would be one big one. Um, 
other than that, you know, where we're at, the stage we're at in our ministry is where actually next week when Malik and I sit down to discuss the coming year, these are things we'll be discussing, uh, the things that you're going to talk about, structuring and organizing these needs that are coming up. Because one of the things we did, and again, this was a deliberate approach that we took based on evaluating what was working in the past and what didn't work in this country in the past, and then letting the scriptures mold and shape our philosophy and then letting the Holy Spirit guide us in how we implement both of those aspects of what did we feel was working and not working and evaluating the past. What does the scripture say we should, our philosophy and approach should be, and then the Holy Spirit guiding that. And what we ended up doing, because we really were starting from scratch, right? The emphasis we placed was never on attending a specific meeting that you need to be here at church. You need to be here three to thrive and, and you got to be here whenever the doors are open. What we emphasized was the family structure and nature of the church. And one thing about working in an Islamic country that you can take for granted in a country where people are more responsible responsive to the gospel. One thing you, you you don't take for granted in a Muslim country is how absolutely dependent you are on the Holy Spirit to change people's lives, uh, to, to open their eyes to the gospel and to, to bring them to that moment of salvation. I mean, it, it, you, you just can't there's no manipulating numbers. There's no manip, you know, one, two, three, pray after me. You don't see any easy believism type deal going on in this country. It just, it doesn't happen. And you become so dependent on, and you have to become sensitive to the leading and working of the spirit um, that I just became convinced that being faithful to the assembly of believers is natural to a spirit-led Christian. So I don't have to try to try to manipulate or, or just plead with people to be at church when it's open. That should be the natural desire of somebody walking with Jesus. And so we just emphasized, you're in a family. You need to walk with Jesus, first of all, and be led of the spirit as an individual and as you grow in your individual walk with the Lord, you're going to be drawn to obeying him. And as a member of the body of Christ, you have an obligation to the body. You don't have an obligation to a place. Okay. And a lot of times I think what happens, and I'm just speaking from my experience and what we evaluated, but I think when we emphasize you need to be at the church building on Sunday morning or Sunday night, you need to be at there, that we make Christianity or the Christian walk about being in a place and not being, not being a disciple, not walking with Jesus. And we as preachers will kind of evaluate somebody's faithfulness based on whether they're at a service or not. Now, you will assemble with the believers if you are being led of the spirit, but it shouldn't, it, it doesn't have to be something that's forced or like, come on, just come on, people be there. Why aren't you there? And so we, we place that emphasis in our teaching and pastor Malik and I on your individual walk with the Lord and your obligation to the family, which we're living in a culture where you have obligations to your family that outweigh every other responsibility in life. You're responsible to your mom and dad. You're responsible to your brother and sister. You're responsible to take care of one another. You all live together and everybody knows their place. And so we wanted to carry that over into the life of the church. And when that became the life and culture of the church, then when we had a Friday night prayer service, people came. It wasn't, it was just, they're there because they understood this is the family and I have an obligation to be here to serve and to be here to to labor and pray for one another. Not everybody's faithful the way we want them to be, but we found that was we never had to use any type of manipulation tactic. We've never done any like big Sunday. Uh, you know, if everybody comes out, you're going to get a popsicle or everybody who comes out, you know, you're going to get in which. And again, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Um, 
but there's nothing we've we've ever done for church to to try to draw people to come to church anybody who comes it's a result of relationship it's a result of contact and um, that's where we've wanted from the beginning and again that was just the way the lord led us and now we're at a place where we just see people faithful now i will say and i want you to get into some of your structure because now what i'm seeing we've got the people who are faithful now but now we need structure <laughs> now we need a decorating committee now we need a, a kind of somebody who's good at organizing a sunday school and and organizing a schedule so so that's where we're at right now we're at the place where everybody's in their place now we need kind of all right now we need to put a, implement a plan uh for you know our sunday school right now we we need a plan for how we're going to approach this coming year and we've been working on that and so that that's where we're at so i love to hear some of what what are some of the things you've done and how you've implemented uh that structure in your church i think that's one of the most exciting things for those missionaries who may be listening today as josh and i have gone over to the statistics of those who've listened to the podcast it literally is all over the world and sometimes when i take a look at that list josh and i think wow there's a person listening to us in africa and indonesia and you know japan i'm thinking you know that will help us as we express our context and which the ways we are serving you know, we understand this is not a one size fits all. Uh, with that being said, Josh brought up a great point talking about church attendance. And yet at the same time with their Christian walk, thinking about the family and the culture, that's one of the reasons why we made that decision not to have a two services, just for the reason I have two services, because it fit better the context of having uh, people be able to spend time with their family to go maybe see their mothers or the fathers. And yet at the same time, how can we efficiently give them basically the same amount of preaching and teaching and worship that we would in that one and a half, two hour time period. And so I think that's what kind of we're talking about. It's like, we have these Bible principles. We have the, the desire to disseminate God's word and get it in people's lives. But you know, the ways we do it can be different. And so, but that being said, um, as you now, Josh, are getting to this point, and we've been here for a little bit of time, as we've been able to sometimes hand over the ministries to others. Now I say this, not being a expert on this situation. That is one of the things that I think all missionaries will struggle with some more than others is being able to not only train leaders, but then to delegate that to properly say, okay, I'm going to trust you with this. But as we have done that over the years, there are times when you have to look over those ministries and see if, okay, now that I've handed this ministry over is it being properly led is it being properly directed uh is it is it going forward in the direction that we want for instance right now we're in the middle of a transition with our nursery leader our nursery leader couldn't be a better nursery director helping arrange the proper ladies to get together to to watch the children but she right now is going through a season in life where she's having to watch her sick mother so she can't really attend church services very often and so th that that's a practical thing that's not a character situation or problem thankfully we record our messages she enjoys getting those messages and playing them for her mother but you know she can no longer stay in that um position so we're constantly looking for okay who's the next director how can we find someone who properly fills not only the ability to do it but also for me and this is one thing i like to speak of is josh is now kind of entering this stage of life, which is you have to be very careful, not only for the ability of the person you're training, but their character. Uh, character is very important. Uh, even if it's serving a nursery, serving uh, as, a, as a greeter, serving in a choir, serving in a sound booth, I think it's very important that our Christian walk is known throughout the community as a good Christian walk, a maturing Christian walk. We have had many times in our church where we've had to ask people very discreetly to step aside from ministry while we worked with them and helped them. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think it's very biblical. I think you always want to do your best if there's known sin to how to deal with it properly with people. Uh, if they're serving, have them take a step back. But yet at the same time, the idea is restoration, not forever. Uh, maybe in certain ministries it would be, but but in ministries that we're talking about where there's they're using their talents and abilities for the Lord. But I think there has to be, that's the spiritual growth. And so, uh, Josh, as you now look forward to uh, maybe setting some people in motion in your church to do different things, um, are these things you've grappled with and thought about of people who are not only just talented enough, but also do they have the right character to serve uh, the body of believers there? Oh, yeah, that's so essential. And that's one of the big things that um, there's a young man that he's he's gifted. 
Uh, he's a natural leader, but he's lacking in some disciplines. And so we're wait, we're working with them. <coughs> Excuse me. We're working with them in those areas of discipline that um, once we see faithfulness in those little areas, then we can begin to implement more areas of ministry and let him lead and take leadership in other areas. And so he's already actively involved, but it's like he's just missing that one more step of just taking ownership and, and taking that and owning it. And so one of the problems of some of the guys who had come to our church, there were two guys specifically who had been influenced by the Mormon church before they came and got saved through our ministry. Um, but what the Mormons did, okay, they came into our town about two years ago. All right. And here's how they, the Mormons do church planning. All right. Don't let their numbers of people they say join their cults. Okay. It's all skewed. It's, it's all nonsense. But here's what they do. They came into our city and they m made advertisements to, they kind of hang out near where they can find church areas. Or if they're in a place like Senegal, they're going to try to find Nigerians, people who come from a culture that already understands evangelical language and culture. And they'll say, hey, we're starting a new church. Um, if you'll come, uh, we'll put you through a one-year program through our institute. We'll pay for it. And if you can recruit 10 other people, after you do this institute and we'll pay you actually, they'll tell you, we'll pay you to go to our institute. And when you're done, if you can recruit 10 other people, we'll call you a church. Like you'll be a church and you'll be the pastor. So after one year of training, they, they pay some random guy to do, he'll get 10 of his buddies and they'll meet in his house and they'll do church service. And then the Mormon missionary writes back and says, Hey, we just got a church started. You know, we need more money. It's insane. And they've done that all. It's just, it's crazy. And there's no, I know a couple of the guys who were involved in it. And I know for a fact, these guys are not Christian at all. They come from, you know, a background where they understand Christian culture. But I thought, man, I don't know. It's just a bunch of nonsense. Now, it's one thing for a cult to do it. It's another thing. And it's a temptation sometimes for missionaries you get a guy in there and you're like, oh man, he just seems to be naturally gifted. I'm going to start investing, let him take lead, let him take charge. And you don't wait and you don't evaluate character and you don't do the research and uh, you're just setting yourself up for disappointment and a fall. And um, I'm thankful for one to have Pastor Malik uh, as a partner in the ministry here because he has insight into characteristics of other nationals to try to evaluate things that he can pick up character flaws that I may not be able to pick up because they're going to be one way in front of the two Bob, the white guy. And, uh, but they can't hide certain things in front of another national. And so, um, that's just, uh, it's very important to, I think as you're evaluating somebody's character, try to have a partner in ministry who's a national who can help you in that process as well that maybe you can you can bounce off and and they can say hey pastor you know i uh even if you're the lead pastor even if they're not a pastor just somebody who's wise and elder in the church that can just say hey you know pastor um he this is a great guy but there's just a few things that that i see in this young man that pastor i would recommend maybe holding off giving him certain responsibilities. And that would be a big help. Just patience is the key word. You don't want to ruin years of ministry by turning everything over to the wrong person and seeing the whole thing collapse and implode from within. Yeah. That patience is uh, definitely the right word and just taking time. And by the way, there's, there's nothing wrong with seeing people make spiritual steps and oh, yeah. getting them involved in small ways. You know, we have, for instance, in our church, you know, a security team and, you know, parking lot and, you know, sound booth, those things are not spiritually necessarily minded in any sense. And people who, as long as they're, you know, believers and they're baptized and part of your church, those are great ways to start. 
And so maybe there's ways, uh, missionaries, you're listening today to get people started in a, in a small way, maybe just to see how their uh, faithfulness is to that. But as we continue on, um, I think with every ministry, we want to be able to reevaluate at the end of the year. Uh, the, are we having a spiritual impact? Are we seeing fruit? Are we seeing lives changed? Are lives edified through this ministry? Or are we just spending time and resources on something that is uh, not having a, a lasting impact? Now, there are seasons of life where these make sense, but I just jotted down a few that uh, classes and things I've done in the past, for instance, we've had English classes in certain ministries where it was a way to try to connect with the community, to come out and hear the church. And early on in our church life, early on in the church life, for Pastor Ari, I did that. And that was a blessing. I think it got the name out in the community. But we also hit a time where it was just, just using our time and it was not really seeing a lot of spiritual fruit and so the times in lives where you're just getting the word out who you are in the community and there are times when you say okay i need to use my time uh, more wisely uh, there was another time when um, pastor Ari did that with computer classes for the, the neighborhood children it was a good opportunity to invest in the community and show the community that this church wasn't here to take but this church was here to give. And so we did that for a time, but there became a time where Pastor Ari and his schedule needed to spend more time in evangelism and, and, and sermon prep. And then, you know, there are times in my life where I've done different baseball ministries at baseball fields, sharing the gospel, and, and we would see more spiritual fruits sometimes than others. And so th those are just some things that, you know, we will call them extra. They're outside of the church sphere, but they, they can often be helpful, but there are seasons in life and you get to the end of the year and say, you know, uh, that time has passed. It's time to spend my time more wisely. Have you, I know you guys have had a lot of different ministries like that. Are you constantly making tweaks and changes in that way, Josh? Yeah, those are things. I think it's the nature of every ministry. You're going to have ministries that come and go ministries that you do in different seasons. Um, you know, we've had, we've tried different things, things that haven't worked, things that have worked. And so, yeah, there's, a, I've had millions of ideas and then that you write down on paper and then when you try to implement them it's just it's a bomb and so you have to be uh yeah you just have to be constantly constantly keeping focus on what is the grand scheme here what is the main thing what are you here to do and um whether you're sharing the gospel uh within the church context or whether it's through building relationships in your community which i think is so essential um, yes, like you said, those things, maybe, maybe be involved in a sports team or being involved in, in a teaching English, those things are conduits through which we can build relationships, but the, there also can be, you know, change, they're changeable. You, you can stop one, remove another. I think you should always be looking at avenues to make inroads with your community. Um, just the other day we did gift distribution. Uh, with the Samaritans purse boxes and we went out to a village nearby and somebody in the village knew Pastor Malik and that's how he contacted us, Pastor Malik, and asked if we could come to their school in the village and distribute the gifts. And of course, we, we tell them we got to share the gospel and we're going to present and all this. And um, what I loved about it was when we got out there, everything was about Pastor Malik. And this is an Islamic village in a school that is run by Islamic teachers. And they're all calling him pastor, which is not a usual term that people use here. Most people, when I say I'm a pastor, most people here are like, what on earth is a pastor? Like, what? This, in, in French, it's the same idea of shepherd. You know, you're like, what? Like, what? What are you doing? And so, yeah. And so the idea is um, to see an entire village in school they wrote this beautiful paper with all these designs and pictures from the students. And it said, thank you, Pastor Malik. And it was just touching to see how um, not only was were they receptive of Pastor Malik, but they, were, they weren't looking at this as being like the white guy ministry. It was about the church, Yakar Jusach, and Pastor Malik and his leadership. And Julie and I just kind of stepped back and we just watched from the back as they did the distribution and, and our kids got involved as well. So that being said, yeah, the, you always want to find different inroads, ways that you can build relationship so that you can share the gospel within the context of, um, you know, the gospel and building and growing the church and the kingdom of God. And so, sure, there's going to be a lot of things that will change, 
a lot of things that you implement that maybe don't work. And I'll just say this from my personal experience, my my personal, like, I think it's a weakness. Like I, I love having vision. I love being able to say, man, these are things we want to do, ministries we want to implement. But my leadership style I've noticed when I evaluate myself is if I want something done, it's the old adage. If you want something done right, do it yourself, just do it yourself. Right. And I'm the type of person who, if I, if I lead a ministry, I naturally will want to, if it's not getting done to the standard, I would like it to, I just take over and like, you know what, just let me do it. All right. I'll just take the wheel. I'll get it done. And you, you maybe will have an, an excellent program on Sunday and everything's in its place, but you're the one doing it all. You've done nothing to grow the maturity of the leadership of the church. People haven't gotten involved. And so I found that even with our music ministry, I led the music up until our last furlough. And then Malik turned it over to a, a another young man. And he has a team of um, music, um, um, I guess, I don't even know what you call it, the music people, they get up and sing. And they're not all natural with music, but they have the heart and they're willing. Um, and it's not the standard I would like it to be at with the way we, we would do a music service. But I just held off and I'm, I'm just holding back. I'm not because if I get involved, because even my wife said, Josh, why don't you play guitar? And I said, well, if I start playing guitar, I'm going to want to take the lead of the temple. I'm going to want to take the lead of the singing. Like, so I'm just going to wait until maybe they, they take the initiative and ask if I'll, I'll help them. And um, Pastor Malik then later asked if I would help set up a Christmas program. And I suggested, well, how would I meet with the music team every Friday and uh, just kind of coach them through how we could do a, you know, better improve to glorify Jesus and to edify the church to better improve the music uh, section of our worship service. And he said, yeah, that's a great idea. And so just kind of implementing that and uh, just instead of taking over on a Friday night, I'll, I'll help them. We're going to grow that. I'll coach them through kind of leading a, a, the music section and then uh, they'll implement it on Sundays. And so it's things like that. Yeah, you have to know yourself just because it's something you can do well. Somebody, you might not have somebody in your team that can do it or you're, you know, a national that can do it. So maybe don't implement that ministry until you either have somebody that you can train to do it or uh, if it's something you're willing to, as soon as you step off, it's going to stop. You know what I mean? If it's a ministry that you do, but as soon as you're out of the picture, it's done. If you're, if that's fine and it's not going to damage the church overall, then those are the two things you have to consider. Yeah. It's funny. Cause that's actually the next question I had, which is basically, are we training others to do the work of the ministry? And just a plug for our last podcast, Josh's interview with Bob Mack. There's a great section in there where Bob Mack who has many years of ministry experience, uh, does a great job at articulating uh, how he wouldn't take over certain ministries there uh, in, his, um, in his scope of ministry so that the nationals would own that um, ministry and do a good job at it. And he would have oversight, he would see from afar, uh, but he was really well at articulating uh, how he would approach in certain ways and in other ways not, kind of what Josh is talking about. And that really is, I think, probably some of the greatest maybe the two greatest struggles for practical missions after you've gotten your church started, after you're evangelizing, after you're discipling is not only the training of a leader, but then actually handing over the reins of that leadership and uh, properly maybe guiding their steps. Uh, I know for us, that is a, always a struggle, even though we've been able to send out two church planners. I, it's funny how it's easier for me, I guess, in a sense to direct from afar and encourage them in the decisions they're making and maybe even help them make decisions but yet when it's in our church context uh we we are maybe clinging to things a little more and so that i think that is something that, that all missionaries in some ways uh deal with and if you find friends for instance we have the blessing to have a number of missionary friends here i i have a lot of friends who have churches where they are doing a terrific job of not only training mission uh, training leaders up but sometimes handing those ministries over and i want to kind of add that as a parenthesis is take time to talk to other missionaries mm -hmm. see how other missionaries doing there there it's a guarantee that other missionaries are doing things better than you in certain areas and you want to learn from that mm -hmm. um you want to 
um, be guided by some of those principles and be encouraged. And uh, so that's kind of what we're trying to do today is encourage everyone to, um, to look to these factors as you do evaluation. But I think one of the things I want to stress, and we talked about a little bit of before, is it is, it is kind of a two-pronged process. One is properly training uh, a person to do something that you don't need to be doing, or that, you know, even if they won't do it as well as you think you would do it. One, you're, you're, you're getting that indigenous spirit started, implemented into the work. But the second thing is making sure that person is um, spiritually where they need to be. I, I can't emphasize that enough. I think a lot of times the balance is we want to delegate, but sometimes we don't have the and so that really I think maybe we can do a podcast on this Josh the number one ministry as missionaries is our ministry of the word and uh, I think we're going to have another podcast maybe we can talk about how the Lord directs us to preach the series the messages the books that we do to really uh, work on those people's hearts so that they're properly trained but yeah I, I just want to say that as mission is we have to do a better job i know i do my my greatest weakness is uh, not just training uh but delegation and then just allowing people the opportunity to make mistakes so you can come come along and help them uh i'm sure that's something you've seen along the way and are are excited to see now as you uh, develop it even more now absolutely yeah there's no doubt about it these are uh, important aspects practical aspects of ministry and uh, just next week Malik and I will sit down. We're going to have our um, kind of our planning out of the coming year, some of the new ministries we're going to start and get implemented. Now that we have a faithful core of, of members coming out, we need to begin implementing more of them into different ministries, developing our children's ministry and uh, getting our children more engaged with the gospel. One of the things that we're going to do with our children's ministry is uh, there's about four men in our church, myself included, that really could qualify to teach the Bible. Maybe don't two of them don't fully qualify to be a pastor, and one of them certainly wouldn't. That's not his desire. He's a doctor, uh, in our, a doctor in town, but he's um, he could certainly qualify to be an elder or a, a deacon in the church. And so one of the things that um, we're going to start doing is not is have a cycle of these four men, myself included, doing a session with the kids every Sunday morning. And so that way they're getting male leadership in teaching the scriptures, which I think is sometimes missed. And it's really important. Now, God bless the women who lead children's ministries and teach children and, and impact children. Okay. Um, the biggest impact, and I'll just say this as an aside, the biggest impact in my style of preaching, okay, was maybe not style, but my approach to how I would preach um, using narrative to exegete the scripture. As I do exegetical preaching, using a narrative approach to, to preach truth, that came from when I was a kid in junior church at my grandfather's church, my junior church teacher, Alma Dickinson. She was just the sweetest lady and uh, taught Sunday school, our junior church, and she made the Bible come alive. Do you remember the flannel graph, the old, the old, <laughs> oh yeah, the old Betty Lukens flannel graph, and she, she, she made those little flannel graph pieces come alive, and the Bible just, it was real, the way she would teach, and when God called me to be a preacher and a missionary, when I found out that I had to preach, that's what I drew from that experience of I want to present the scriptures in a way that made it come alive the way that my junior church teacher. So so ladies, if you're, you're teaching children, don't ever take for granted the impact that you're having on those children. But I also say I think it's important for the spiritual men, the leaders in your church to make an impact on the children in your church teaching them scriptures. And so that's one thing we're going to start implementing next year is having uh, different men in the church take a month at a time and do a lesson with the children and then the women finish up. And so, yeah, different things like that. Uh, you just, you want to always be thinking about how can the people in your church fulfill their role and their responsibility in edifying the church. We're not just attenders of a meeting uh, we are members one of another, 
and we're called to edify one another. And so as a spiritual leader, as a shepherd, it's our job to help guide the members into where they can serve. We are the chief servant and it's our job to figure out where everybody else can serve best so that Jesus Christ is glorified and the gospel goes out. And so, yeah, as we go into the new year, that's what we'll be looking at as we advance and uh, seeing the church grow in this part of the world. Well, as we wrap up, Josh, I think the kind of the point of the message and the podcast today was to, before we can look forward to where we're going, we need to know where we're at. And I think that's kind of the point of today is as we often do in our lives, kind of self-evaluate. Um, I want to just kind of end this podcast on some ideas for resources. It's always a great idea to get other resources to help you along the way. A couple of books that have helped me over the years, and obviously, you know, these are guys that aren't necessarily particularly in our circles, but very helpful books that help me uh, specifically. One is the book Simple Church by uh, Eric Geiger and Tom Rayner. Uh, that was really good at just giving some principles of how to evaluate a ministry and then put things in their importance. And I think there's so many great principles. Obviously, it comes from a setting uh, in America, in an American setting, but there are great principles that I think are very helpful to maybe recalibrate our minds to putting the gospel-centered ministry first and then everything kind of flowing from there. And so I, I encourage you to read that book if you haven't. Another one is uh, called Deliberate Church by Mark Dever. Um, this is a really good overview of just, once again, kind of focusing the ministry of the church around the Word of God first and then having other parts of the ministry kind of flow out. Obviously, for missionaries, it will apply different context senegal dominican republic japan wherever um but i think there are lots and lots of great resources especially in the last 20 years that kind of kind of have this in their crosshairs but those are two books that are kind of a blessing to me josh i don't know if there are any podcasts other than ours or any uh resources that uh have helped you along the way then and these kind of specific areas of maybe a church life and ministry yeah for my personal you know my Personally, I'm not natural at um, being an organizer. I'm not naturally gifted at, uh, you know, structuring kind of an organized way of approaching. I uh, Maybe I can come up with a vision, but then implementing it and like coming down with, okay, how are we going to manage this uh, is not necessarily where I'm strong at. And the Apostle Paul said, covet earnestly the best gifts. Um a lot of times we can use the excuse, well, I'm not gifted in that area. The Apostle Paul said you need to be, you get one or two freebies, okay? The freebie is the gift that the Spirit gave you. The rest you need to be working at. And so um, where evaluate where you're weak in and find good books that will help you. Um, uh, I've read through in a book that's really helped me in my personal uh, life and structuring just kind of the discipline of a structured life is Paul Chapel's book on stewarding life. And what I appreciate about Pastor Chapel is he'll take experiences that he's gone through, maybe some negative experiences or something that he should have implemented and he didn't. And then he'll, he'll share that. Like I, he'll share, this is what I learned. This is what I was doing wrong. And this is what I implemented and changed. And so, and I appreciate about that when a leader can, can, is honest and transparent, that's very helpful. And so, in fact, I think that's what we're trying to do with this podcast is be transparent about life as missionaries, the reality of it, and then try to be helpful. And so his book, Stewarding Life, kind of touches on some personal disciplines that I think would help. Um, his podcast, Spiritual Leadership, I actually just listened to uh, last week. He talks about planning the new year, things like that. And so um, a lot of great resources with that. And um, just anything in general, Pastor Scott Wendell. I don't know if he's had any books written. I hope he will publish some. He's one of the most organized men I personally know when it comes to putting together sermon series and church structure and all of that. But uh, he would do sessions at, our, at Camp Bimmy for or at a candidate school. And so he, he has, they, their church has some resources and, um, I'm not sure if he has any books out or anything, but, um, just get around men who have areas that they're gifted in that maybe you're not find a mentor that can help you and get good books and listen to good podcasts that can help you, uh, to develop in those areas that you need to develop in. And I'll say this as we close as well, what I try to do going into every new year 
is I'll try to find what are three or four things that I want to learn this year. And, and this, this can be biblical or not. All right. Uh, last two years ago, I wanted to learn to play the piano. So I didn't, I didn't learn how to play notes, but when COVID hit, I just watched YouTube videos and learned how to play chords and, and, and play a few songs. And so just little things like that. Like one year I, I wanted to learn how to cook, you know, kind of do a, a master chef type of deal. And so I did some videos and watched some videos with Gordon Ramsay, different things like that and teaching how different cooking. So continually to develop, challenge yourself. So find, find areas and say, Hey, this year, not even a resolution. You can make it a resolution, but just say, Hey, this year I want to challenge myself. What are some things that I want to learn? I want to learn how to edit video this year. I want to learn how to, um, you know, play the guitar, do this or that. And you got to keep your mind constantly engaged, especially when you're on the mission field, because you can get in such a rut of uh, the monotony of the mission field uh, that you you can stop challenging yourself. And so whether it's taking a, uh, some online courses for theology or, or learning something new, just, just branch out there and try to stretch yourself. And the new year is a good time to do that. That would be my recommendation. Well, those are all great recommendations. And uh, listener, please reach out to us. Let us know. Maybe there's some recommendations you have for resources or podcasts you listen to that encourage you in, as far as the area of ministry. We want to be a blessing to you, but we love to hear more back from those who are listening, take time to review our podcast, rate it, uh, share it with your friends. Uh, Josh, is there anything you'd like to leave with us today? No, I just want to thank everybody for uh, following our page. We just reached 500 followers on our Facebook page, and we'd like to see that keep growing. And so be sure to like and share. (laughs) Exactly. 500 moms out there. (laughs) Uh, We've we've been getting (laughs) some great feedback, though. A missionary uh, in Asia just contacted me recently, and uh, was sharing how just the, the podcast has been a blessing and uh, the interviews we've been doing. And so, um, yeah, stay in touch with us. Be sure to get the word out. And uh, we have about just as many people watching the podcast as we do listening to the podcast. And so um, we just want to thank you for doing Sorry. that. Thank you for enduring that. And uh, let us know, is there a topic that you would like to hear us talk about, whether you're a missionary or not, what do you want to know about mission life? What's something that could help you? Let us know, send us an email, put a comment down on our page, and we will try to address those things. And we appreciate it so much. So from over here in Senegal, West Africa, have a happy new year. Hope you had a Merry Christmas. Happy new year. See you on the flip side. (laughs) God bless.